All right, YouTube, welcome back to the channel. This is Hank Strange. I'm hanging out with my buddy, Sam Andrews. You've seen um, his beautiful exotic holsters featured on the channel. Today, we're gonna do a quick how-to video of how do you make a specific Sam Andrews holster. We're gonna, our gun that we're gonna use is the Glock 19. I'm gonna turn everything over to Sam and he's gonna walk us through it. Here. Thanks for having us, Sam. Thank you. One of the things I'm asked most frequently is how do you make these things? And how does it go from raw material to finished goods? And there's no great secrets in Leathercraft. In two days, I can teach anybody all the basics of Leathercraft. After that, it's practice. You start out with just sheets of cowhide. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a time warp because the real duration in making one of these holsters is about three days because there's lots of drying time, finish curing time, things where you don't have your hands on them. So, this is the highlights. There's two methods of cutting out the leather. On the things that I make a lot of, I'll have a clicker die made, it's kind of like a cookie cutter for leather, sharp on one edge, and these all have to be made to my patterns, so it's costly. And I only yeah. do it for things I'm building a lot of. Okay. You place it on the leather, and when this machine is turned on, which I'm not going to do because it's very loud and you won't be able to hear me speaking, mm -hmm. the machine head swings over, it's hydraulic, and it punches down with tons of force and just shears out the shapes. Okay. What we're going to do today is a hand cut, which is still most of what I end up doing. I've got the pattern here for the Glock 19, Basic so, pancake style holster. Pancake style. So right. this is a pancake style, which is going to be outside of the waistband. Exactly. Okay. I have to, in my catalog, I call it a saddle style because the word pancake is copyrighted for holsters. I couldn't use it. For okay. Print, so in, so if anyone's looking at this online, it's going to be saddle style. Saddle style. Okay. Because it fits your size like a saddle on a horse's back. The back is smaller than the front because when it's all made, you want enough bunched up leather to create the gun pocket. Mm -hmm. If it was two equal parts, when you put it on, it's going to tighten over the weapon to the point where you have a hard time getting it out. This is the tough part of any kind of holster making, is creating the patterns. That's what took me years and years and years of practice and trial and error with heavy emphasis on the error part. So I've thrown away reams of paper. We trace it out, mark where the slots are going to go for the belt. And then I make my little stop and start marks for the stitching, so I don't overrun. Traditional leather craft, they teach you to cut with a head knife or a straight knife, and it's usually drawn toward you. Mm -hmm. Very hard to control, mm -hmm. can't take turns, and you have to keep going over and over the same cut multiple times. With this that I locked onto, the knife goes through in one easy slicing motion, and the point of the knife is not hitting the hard surface of the table, it's going into the carpet. There's any like budding this. holster makers out there, go down to the carpet market and grab some scraps, and it makes life very, very simple. Oh, and safety tip, always cut away from you. A lot of people I show this to, they, they try and turn their wrist to go around the corners, mm -hmm. and you lose control, and if you do slip, which does happen, you don't want the blade coming back toward you. The next thing is to line the holster, because if I leave it raw leather inside, it's going to tear up a weapon, and even a tough finish like a Glock, I don't want to do mm -hmm. that to it. Two linings I use. Okay. The common lining is a suede lining, soft suede. The okay. cowhide's been finished differently, oh, it's a different nice. tanning method. Mm -hmm. Or some people prefer a smooth leather lining, Oh, and okay. that's really just customer choice. Then you want to, A, check you don't have the grotty side where it's going to show, because on hide you'll have a good side and an ugly side. Now we're going to glue it to the ugly side, which has, you know, some scars and things, so mm -hmm. that what shows will be the pretty. Okay. The lead just holds it in place while you trim out the That's lining. some serious lead. <laughs> had that since I started. You cut out your lining with a good bit of edge because later when we trim it, you want something to hold on to. And we glue them together. This is a special contact cement, which actually comes from the shoe industry. It's called barge cement. And it is so incredibly strong when the bond dries that you'll tear the material rather than the glue bond if you try to take it apart. So you put the glue on both surfaces because it actually bonds to itself. And being that the leather is porous, it soaks in. Normally I let it sit just a few minutes to get the glue tacky. Mm -hmm. 
but it works even if you put it together. Right What's away. the setup time on it? You can leave it sit for five or ten minutes and it'll still go together, okay. but it's not good to let it get too dry. I rub it down on the back with this piece of smooth plastic just to make sure we've really got a good tight seal, especially at the edges, because you don't want the stuff peeling away in use. You can see the edge sort of appear as a shadow through there. That lets you know you've got a good seal on it. And I take it just off the edge of the table so I can put the blade through the suede material. Okay, and this is where you needed the extra to grab onto? This is why I have some edge. It is important to keep the finger away from where the knife is coming through, though I do keep a good supply of band-aids in the shop. Now the lining is inside and ready to be stitched in place. I stitch it along the edge because over years I wouldn't want to trust the glue by itself Absolutely. to hold everything down. Okay. We prepare for that by using a groover. It's a saddle maker's groover. This has an adjustable width cutter and you have a little tiny hole in the edge there which is sharp on the inner end and so it creates a groove for the stitches to lie in. Not only does it act as a guide, but it gets the stitches below flush so they're less liable to be worn off in use. And the next is to sew it on the great big messy sewing machine. They're beautiful. Now, they were made in the days before seal bearings, so they require a lot of oiling and a lot of wiping down. And it's got the needle upstitching through the pre-made hole. Many different colors of thread, okay. especially right. when I'm doing the exotic materials, okay. because we want to match the color to oh, okay. it's being sewn on. Okay. This thread is a bonded nylon. The bonded part means it's sealed to be chemically proof against ultraviolet, oil, solvents, etc. Just raw nylon can rot over years of use. I use the longer needle pointed knife so I can get down in the hole with the thread to trim it off. You don't want frilly ends of thread sticking out, it just doesn't look very professional. So the end result here, it's bonded by glue and thread. It's bonded, it's stitched, it's never coming apart. Right. Well, as you see, this edge is very, very square. Not only is it not very pretty, but it's going to catch on things. Now enter the bevelers. These are little V-shaped tools which are sharp on the inner edge. They come in various sizes. This is a three, this is a five. And what they do is they cut a round edge on the material. Now we have this all beveled. The edges are rounded, but they're still a little bit rough. So the next step is to slick the edges, which is done in two steps. Over here, I made a slicking bar for this grinder motor by shaping a piece of aluminum with various grooves. You wet the edge very thoroughly. You can make holsters with five or six basic tools. It doesn't take a great deal of cost or expense. The automation helps when you're doing a hundred holsters at a time. It is a little more dampening and then we go back to the workbench where I do the hand slicking part. Again, highly technical. Just take an old smooth tool handle and you give it a further rub down. This is where you get that really hard mirrored finish to the edge. Okay, it's almost like polishing your exactly. shoe leather. One of the best benchmarks for good leather work, as opposed to more mundane, is pick it up and feel the edges. Mm -hmm. A lot of mass-produced holsters you'll pick up have rough, raw edges. Mm -hmm. And that just means they're cutting corners and they're not spending the time that they should be doing to get them Absolutely slick and glassy smooth. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is glassy smooth <laughs> indeed. And then because you mushroom the edge a little bit when you're pressing on it, I again take the, the smooth plastic and I just flatten it out. The next thing is to put in the slots for the belt loops. I wanted a slightly wider slot than the old narrow ones I used to use. It's easier to put a heavy belt through the wider slot. Okay. So I've drawn the holes for the slots onto the holster, and I look down through the top of the punch to align it with my pen marks. Not sure if you can see that inside with the camera. So I line that with the pen marks, and then I take my very heavy mallet and apply it briskly. And these 
punch has got very clean, very nice slots. Alright, it's ready for the next stage, which is I put my maker's stamp on the back. I just have to dampen it a touch. Anytime you want to make an impression in leather, stamping, decorating, whatever, it needs to be damp. In okay. that state, it will take a shape and it will hold it when it dries. Here's a little tip I learned the hard way. If you hit one of these stamps with a hard mallet, either the rawhide or the plastic, it will bounce and you'll get double impressions. So my father brought me from the automotive store a dead blow hammer. It's got the powdered lead in the head, so it doesn't bounce. Oh, okay. All the force ends up dead blow. There. Awesome. And it makes a very clean stamp with no secondary that you have to clean up. Awesome. But while it's still flat, I like to put my stitching lines on. Okay. Because it's so much more difficult when you've got the thing all tented up. Back to my little glue pot. I actually uh, sew it in two goes because if I glue both sides down, the middle part gets tented up so much that the swing arm in the sewing machine can sometimes hit the leather and leave marks. So by sewing this front side flat, and then I come back and bend this up and glue it. Oh, okay. It's less liable. It's a better to, result. Exactly. It's, it's another step, but it makes a better finished product. Another dead blow hammer and this old anvil make a great combination for really having the pieces that you've glued sealed together well because you don't want them shifting under the pressure of the stitcher. Now we're back to our little saddler's tool to make the groove and return to the sewing machine. Get that first stitch started, adjust the pressure. <laughs> Very good. So again, we trim the thread down inside the hole. Get rid of any fuzz. And I've wet the middle part to make the leather malleable so I can bend it and tent it up to create that gun pocket in the middle. It makes it simpler to glue the other side. When you put this together, you're lining up your edges, the inner edges of your slot. Check it by eye and make sure everything is where it's supposed to be. Then apply the framing device smartly so that it stays where it's supposed to be. We're back to our groover. And we'll repeat the stitching operation that we just did on the front side. And now all the stitching operations are completed. We've sewn the edges for the lining. We've sewn the two sides for the function of creating the holster shape. Now we're back to edging. Now these edges are rough and very slightly uneven. So the very best way to true them up before the beveling is a belt sander. Belt sander. You can do it by hand. You can take the knife and you can you know, carefully trim away what you don't want, which I did on a hobby basis. But it's never going to be absolutely perfect that way. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to step outside to the belt sander. <laughs> belt sander is lovely, but it's big and you can't get into tight little corners. My father set this up for me. He took an old drill press and put a couple of sanding drums on a bolt, which makes an absolutely amazing little inside spindle sander to get to the places that I can't get with the big belt sander. It saves loads of time scraping away with knives and so forth. So little tight inside curves or close up to an edge. Marvelous thing. Yeah, I was wondering how you got into the little close turns like that. Exactly. Very cool. Now we go back to the main table and pick up the bevelers once more because this edge is all true but it's square. Mm -hmm. So back to want to re -bevel. rounding the edges off. The most common function in making a holster or any leatherwork really is edges. You'll spend most of your time doing edges. 
because everything's got an edge and they all have to be dressed, beveled, slicked, sealed. I mean, that's one of the small things that the person who buys this may not notice and they shouldn't notice. Right. They should just be able to pick it up and the smoothness is there. Absolutely. Now we go back to the spindle slicker and give it a machine slick. The secret to getting good slicking is very, very wet on the machine. Okay. If the leather is too dry, the friction will actually cause leather to come off and adhere in sticky gray blobs to the aluminum itself, which makes a very rough and unhelpful surface. So I very often re-wet it. It's better for it to be wet than dry. Yes. Now, of course, you don't want to wet it to the point where it's soft and mushy, mm -hmm. but lots of water for the lubrication, as well as softening up the leather and getting it to all lay the fibers in one direction. And now back to give it the hand slick and finish off those edges. Again, just an old tool handle makes a great slicker. And if it's somewhat soft leather, which tends to mushroom a bit, then I might press it down and then slick it again. Mm -hmm. This is good firm leather and isn't giving me that problem, but I've worked with a lot of material over the years and you learn how to make do. I find if you buy the very best leather in the beginning, you don't have to mm -hmm. flux with it so much. Right. Now our holster is completely assembled as far as all the stitching, slicking, etc. Okay. From here, we're going to shape it. Oh, okay, this is the shaping part. Because I don't think you can get your gun in there very easily. At the no, moment. probably not. It's not even going to get in there, no. as you can see. So we're going to change that, right? Absolutely. Okay. The wonderful thing about leather is it's, it's plastic quality, it's ductile, it's moldable. Mm -hmm. And the way we do that is we wet it. Preferably warm water. Cold water will do, but you have to work harder. Oh, okay. Warm water softens it up. So over okay. here in the molding corner, I keep a hot plate set on very low, just warm. Mm -hmm. If it's too hot, you'll burn the leather. Oh, okay. Some people have read somewhere that you dunk leather in hot water to fit it to your gun. Mm -hmm. One customer many years ago used boiling water. And then he sent the holster back to me saying there's something wrong with it. You could snap it like a saltine cracker. It had dried out to a husk. So, warm yeah. water. Okay. So place it in the warm water, let that soak for just a bit. Again, I don't want to leave it too long because it will go mushy. Mm -hmm. And we just want it moldable. Just pliable enough. Right. Now, when you're doing a very square gun, like a Glock, it helps to open the leather up, a little block of wood or something, just so you don't have such a struggle getting that shape in there. Okay, and this is your Glock 19 blank? This is or the dummy of the, the Glock 19. There's a company in Bay City, Michigan, Duncan Customs, that makes these. Absolute godsend for holster makers. These are not terribly expensive, and when you're doing lots of different holsters. I mean, I must have 250 of these things. Right. It's certainly a lot less investment than the real guns. Mm -hmm. so, and make sure this bottoms out so that the muzzle is close to the end. The trigger guard fills the trigger guard pocket. And basically, leaning on it's a good way to get it down there. You don't want to hammer on it, hit it or anything because the leather is soft and you'll create dings and marks that you then can't get rid of. Okay. So you just work it in right. by hand. And you notice, as I said before, the outer part of the holster, being larger, creates a pocket away from the body so that this flatter side, this curve, fits my hip. Mm -hmm. And the pocket is molded away so that when you draw the gun, the holster doesn't collapse the way a flat holster would do. Oh, okay. The, the rigid gun pocket still holds its shape yeah. and you can reholster without the struggle. Right, without looking. All right. Now, you can see the little dent there that the front sight is making. We don't want front sights dragging. Mm -hmm. So, take a screwdriver, open that up, and then place a dowel in where I want that tunnel to be for the sight and apply the wax stick 
kept that dowel running right down through there. So now you not only have the shape of your weapon, you have a tube, a tunnel made for that right. front sight to run in. Absolutely, so it doesn't impede. Exactly. Now we're going to go right behind you to the molding press. Again, this is something I use because of the production that I do. You could, at this point, mold it completely by hand, but as I'm doing so many at a time, this stuff. saves my poor arms. So this is very, very heavy, dense rubber, top and bottom, and it's a hydraulic press with a 20-ton capacity. Being that this is curved, I put it on some stacked up rubber so oh, it doesn't get flattened out. Okay. A flat holster like a McDaniel or something, I would just lay right down and mold it flat because it's equal both sides. Okay. On this we're trying to retain that curve. Lots of rubber. Oh, lots of rubber of different thicknesses and hardnesses. I've by experimentation found out what gives me the best impression. Slide that under there. Commence the pumping. So I got a workout on top of oh. everything else. Sorry about the squeal. That's okay. Now we leave it in there for about five minutes. Okay. So that the soft leather really tends to mold around the mm -hmm. weapon. And when you take it out, you could dry it and use it as is. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have the deep incised lines of the molded holster. So that will be the next step. <laughs> Now, as you see, the pressure has put in the basic shape of the weapon. So the next step, the boning. And they call it that because traditionally pieces of antler or bone were used as the tool to mark the leather. Give it a little dampness. I, being non-traditional, use these couple of pieces of wood, which I made out of old tool handles. If you've gotten a holster for me in the last 25 years or so, they were molded with these. Okay. And everything that went through the shop has come off this little scrap of leather. This is where all the molding happens. Okay. I use what I call the beaver tail first to get basic shape. You want to outline the weapon. And then I go back over those marks with the needle point to sharpen it up. A Glock is easy. When they designed the Glock, most things were done in straight lines with right angles. Thank you, Gaston. Mm -hmm. Holster makers everywhere are in your debt. Some of the things, especially the revolvers I mold, have so many angles and pitches and different heights, things that they take a great deal of time. Mm -hmm. Glocks are pretty simple by comparison. Now, one of the reasons I do this on the corner of the table is being that this is a curved holster, so I don't flatten out the curve, I have to kind of do it on the edge. Oh, okay. So now I'm going to highlight the tunnel for the front sight, and you end up switching back and forth, back and forth on the tools. And you can kind of see the gun taking shape through the leather. And for all you budding holster makers out there, if you're molding a Glock pistol and you want to highlight the shape of the ejection port, remember when you take the gun out to reach a finger in and press the leather back up, because a Glock has such sharp edges on the port that if you leave the indented leather to dry that way, it will lock the weapon in place and you'll have a terrible time getting it to draw. Oh, okay, so you've got to make that pop back up. Yes, I learned that one the hard way. It's how I learn everything. You know, if, you, if you just reach a finger in and press that leather back up, it will still keep the shape mm -hmm. for the looks, but mm -hmm. it won't interfere with getting the weapon out of the holster. Again, this is one of those you can't rush it steps right. where I will often have tables full of holsters sitting waiting and everything has to go through this. Also with straight holsters, a straight edge makes a nice guide. So don't be afraid to use a ruler or something straight. I'm trying to get those lines in. Basically what you're highlighting is any difference, uh, slide to frame fit, channels, mm -hmm. the outside edge. Now we have the basic shape in there, but this is a tension hold holster. And so I have to open up the little pocket there where the tensioner is going to go so I don't have to struggle. So take this little wedge of wood, again apply the wax stick, 
and just mold that out. So you just brought the indentation back up. Right. So nothing hangs. Right. And now this will go out in the sun for probably a day on each side so it thoroughly dries. You can't mm -hmm. put on any finish, either dye or oil, if the leather is still wet because right. the water won't let anything dry. But at this point it's pretty much set up. It is a finishing. holster. You, you okay. could dry it and so wear even it as it is. The Glock 19 mm -hmm. fits in there very snugly. Almost like it was made for. Now, how long does it usually take out here in the sun? If we've got good sun, a day on each side a day. will do it. Okay. It's frustrating in rainy or very cold times, it takes much longer. Right. So it is a bit weather dependent. Now, when the holster is thoroughly dry and ready for finishing, we're coming to the extremely messy corner of the shop. This is sort of the mad scientist laboratory mm -hmm. area. Think bubbling beakers and mixing test tubes. This is my favorite part. With, with the colors, I'm always mixing, experimenting, finding things that aren't available commercially. Mm -hmm. And most of the things I finish in what's called the oil finish. That's the Neat's Foot Oil. And it gives that deep russet saddle type color to the mm -hmm. leather. That's just the most popular of the finishes. Okay. So when it's dried, it's going to go back to this uh, blonde kind of it look. It becomes the, the, the blonde beige basic leather color. The edge coat is applied with a wool dauber. Now, these come from the store with little hair sticking out all over them. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but it's got lots of little fibers sticking out. Mm -hmm. This creates a problem because the, each of those little fibers is a tiny paintbrush. Yeah, it's going to make a groove. Well, it's, go, it's going mark. to make marks. When you're trying to just coat the edge, it's going to be putting things on the face. So, chap Andy, who worked with me some years ago, he came up with a wonderful solution. You singe them. Just rotate that over the lighter, then brush off all the ash, and you've got a perfectly fiberless little ball of wool. Now this is called edge coat. It's a flexible enamel for sealing the edge. Because, you know, with years of use and rubbing, the fibers can come up and you can get a rough edge to the leather again. So this does two things. It looks good by giving it a two-tone, you know, the darker edge. And it also seals it and holds it down, so with wear it's not going to become all rough again. Since we put so much effort into making those edges nice and slick, I'd like it to stay that way. So basically this is almost like pinstriping. Yes, this is painting the edges. And I've come up with a different formula by mixing several different edge coating products. I wasn't happy with any single one as they came out of the bottle, so I mixed different ones from different manufacturers to get a really dark and slick edge coat. Some of them were too thick and they would be soft and they could wear off. Others were too thin and they bubbled when you put them on. So by putting them together you get the best of all worlds. You're trying to keep an even bead between the edge and the stitching. Not too much, not too little. Again, multiply this by a hundred holsters, what we're normally doing. These big racks here will often be just filled top to bottom at the end of a production run. And it's another of those slow processes, like the hand molding, that there's just no real way to speed up. Mm -hmm. you try to do this fast, you're not going to get very no. good edge coating. Right. Again, careful how you hold it when you change your grip on these things because it will smear so easily if you brush a finger against the wet edge coat. And once it gets on the holster face, you're not getting the stain out. I desperately tried with solvents and water and curses and nothing moves it. All edge coated and then it goes on a peg to dry before applying the oil. The final step on coloring is to apply either oil or dye. In this case, we're going to make it the classic russet saddle color, which is a neat's foot oil finish. Now with oil, you have to be careful not to overdo. 
one or two coats isn't going to do anything, but if you saturate the leather with oil, it will turn into a greasy dish rag and bleed oil forever. So less is more when you're doing an oil finish. Do a nice even coat, let that soak in, touch up as necessary, but a lot of the very cheap holsters in the old days used to be what was called hot oil dipped. They'd literally have a pan full of warm oil, stick the holster in there, and that was pretty well all she wrote for that one. Now, once this oil dries in, it will lighten up considerably. So it takes more than one coat of the oil, and very often, if I have a nice sunny day, I'll put the oil holsters out in the sunlight because it helps penetrate and divide the oil through the leather. Evenly. In the warming. Okay. Then the final step, after it's been colored, is to spray on the sealer. I use a product called acrylic resiline that Feebings makes. Okay. It's an acrylic sealer waterproofer final coat. It gives a soft shine, but it doesn't look plastic or like lacquer. Okay. It bonds right into the pores of the leather. Mm -hmm. And the best way to apply it is with an airbrush. Okay. You can put it on with a dauber, and I did for years in the beginning, but you end up with tiny little fibers from the daubers getting into it, and also streaks from okay. the, the brush strokes. So if you have access to an airbrush, it's but definitely the preferred method. It just takes a fine misting of it, give it an even coat both sides, Very often I'll do a base coat and then go back and put another one over it to get a really good seal. Right. Again, like with the oil, less is more. Mm -hmm. um, if you put on too much, it'll puddle, it'll drip, it's not nice. So mm -hmm. two light coats, much better than one heavy coat. And it dries quickly, maybe five minutes or so. The very final step is the assembly of the retainer. In this case, it's a tension holster. It doesn't have a thumb brake strap. So the screw post goes in the back, the rubber grommet in the middle, get them lined up, they all makes a good guide, in goes the screw, and the advantage of the tension retained holster is you can set it tightly or loosely as you wish, and once the tensioner is installed the holster is fully complete and functional, now it's ready to accept the weapon and you can adjust the tension to whatever tightness you wish when you draw so it's resisted just that first little bit but otherwise it's going to stay in, won't come bouncing out. And this is ready to package and ship to whatever lucky end user is going to wear it.